Greetings and welcome back to Mavanmania Studio here in Leitrim's Iron Mountains. My name is Harriet and today I will be sharing another short watercolour time lapse in my sketchbook. We are almost a week into Mermaid and today's painting will be one of my Mermaid pieces. The prompt list that I am following is by Erica Joy here on YouTube, so I will leave a link below the video to her inspirational prompt list if you would like to join in for the month of May. Also, do go along and check out Erica's channel. She is painting all of her beautiful mermaid paintings on there too. Today's footage is from day six, and the prompt was Juggle. And now when I heard the prompt, I immediately thought Harlequin, a Harlequin clown. The Harlequin clowns are a very old motif, a theatrical character that first appeared in French passion plays in the 12th century and was popularized by the Commedia dell'arte. That's my Italian accent. Commedia dell'arte's the plays of the 16th and 15th century in Italy, and those became widespreadly popular across Europe. They were very popular in England during the Victorian era. When it first appeared in the 17th century in England, it was known as Harlequina, and it is that diamond checkered pattern, synonymous with boho, which was seen as the artsy type. Not quite the underclass of Victoriana, but the people on the fringe, the artsy bohemian of the day. Actors, costumiers, performers, and many artists. The character Harlequin was a trickster and he was like the court jester and he often was accompanied by two other characters, Columbina, which was his mistress, and then Periot, the clown. And Periot is quite an iconic motif in of himself. He is that all-in-white clown with a little black hat and the big black pom-poms and the huge white ruffle that's kind of drooping around his neck. His wife was Columbina, who was also the mistress of Harlequin. So it was like this love triangle that was comical and was an ongoing motif of storyline. And these characters were motif-like and they appeared in many theatrical production of the day. When it first appeared in England, it flourished so much. And this form of theatre was the foundation of what we know today as British pantomime. So I wanted to pay a little bit of homage to um, those early clowns and make my mermaid a Harlequin inspired clown lady. So I gave her a Harlequin tail and I also gave her that huge Periot ruffle. I wanted to do a kind of fusion of a few elements of these characters. I spent much longer than usual on the sketch for this. I just wanted to refine some of the details because with the patterns and the motifs, I wanted to have the details quite accurate before I introduced the paint. I also added some celestial themed motifs to her tail and these motifs were quite common for use in this type of costume and in keeping with that motif she's juggling starfish. Once I had the sketch pretty tidy I went to introduce the colour and I wasn't sure at first what colour I was going to paint this at all. My immediate thought would use black and red but then I kind of thought that was a bit obvious I decided to use brown and lilac. I really like how these colors look together and how this piece turned out. Following on from my last two videos where I have been narrating The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. This is the original text and it's somewhat different from the version that most people are familiar with. Just a little recap. So far in the story, we're introduced to the Little Mermaid and her six sisters, the old grandmother queen who looks after them, and their father, who is the king of the sea palace. And the Little Mermaid has just turned 15 and she's allowed for the first time to travel up to the surface of the water. So let's see what happens. It grew late, but the little mermaid was unable to take her eyes off the ship and the handsome prince. The many-coloured lamps were put out, so no more rockets stored into the sky, and there were no more cannons shot. But deep down in the sea, there was a humming and a droning, where as she sat on the surface, rocking up and down, so she could look into the cabin. But the ships picked up speed, one sail after the other unfurled, and now the waves became stronger. Large clouds filled the sky. 
There was lightning in the distance. Oh, it was going to be a terrible storm. So the sailors reefed in sails and the large ship careered along at a great speed on the wild waves. The water rose to form what looked like a great mountain that would crash down over the mass. But the ship dipped like a swan down between the high waves and let itself be lifted on the towering waters. The thick planking bent and buffeted on the waves, and the mast broke in two as if it was a reed. The ship rolled over on its side, and the water began to pour in. Now the little mermaid realized that they were in danger. She had to take care of herself to avoid the beams and fragments of the ship floating on the water. At one moment, it was so pitch black, she couldn't see the slightest thing. But there was a flash of lightning, and everything came so clear once more she could make out all of them. On the ship, everyone lurched around as best they could. She looked especially for the young prince, and when the ship came apart, she saw him sink down below the depths of the ocean. To begin with, she was quite pleased, but he would be coming down to her. But then she remembered that humans cannot live in the water, and he would not come down to her father's palace, only his corpse. No, he could not be allowed to die. So she swarmed in amongst the beams and planks that drifted on the sea and completely forgot that they might have crushed her. She dived deep between the surface and rose up high again between the waves. And finally, she managed to reach the young prince who was hardly able to swim any longer in the stormy sea. His arms and legs were beginning to go limp and his beautiful eyes to close. He would have died if the little mermaid had not come to his aid. She held his head above the water and let the waves bear her and him wherever they wanted. When morning came, the bad weather was over. Not a shred of the ship was to be seen. The sun rose red and gleaming out of the water and it was as if it was brought to life. When morning came, the bad weather was over. Not a shred of the ship was able to be seen. The sun rose red and gleamed out of the water. It was as if this brought life back to the prince's cheek, but his eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his lovely high forehead and stroked his back, his wet hair. He looked like the marble statue down in her little garden. She kissed him again and wished for him to be allowed to live. She now saw the mainland ahead of her, tall blue mountains with white snow gleaming at their summits and swans were lying there, down by the coast. There were lovely green forests, and in front of them lay a church or an abbey. She did not know for sure, but it was definitely a building. Lemon and orange trees grew in the garden, and the front gate stood a tall palm tree. The shore formed a small bay here, where the water was completely still, but very deep, all the way to the cliff, where fine white silver sand had been washed up. She swam over it with the handsome prince and lay him down on the sand, but made sure that his head lay up high in the warm sunshine. Now the bells in the large white building started to chime, and many young girls came walking through the garden. The little mermaid swam further out behind some boulders that stuck up out of the water. She placed sea foam on her hair and breasts so no one could see her small face and watched to see who came out for the poor prince. It did not take long before a young girl came to the spot. She seemed quite shocked, but only for a moment. Then she fetched some others and the mermaid saw how the prince recovered and that he smiled at all around him, but not out for her. But he did not even know she had saved him. She felt so sad, and when he was led away into the large building, she dived sorrowfully down to the waters and sought her way home to her father's palace. She had always been quiet and thoughtful, but now even more so. Her sisters asked her what she had seen the first time she went above the water, but she did not tell them anything. Many an evening and morning, she rose to the spot where she had left the prince. She saw how the fruits in the garden had ripened and were picked. She saw how the snow melted high on the mountains, but she did not see the prince. And therefore, she was always sadder when she returned home. Her only consolation was to sit in her little garden and embrace the beautiful marble statue that looked like the prince. But she did not tend her flowers. They grew as a wilderness, out over the paths and twined their long stems and leaves along the branches, so it became quite dark there. Finally, she could not bear it any longer and told one of her sisters, and soon all of them had got to hear of it, but only her sisters and a couple of other mermaids who only told their closest friends. One of them knew the identity of the prince, and she'd also seen the festivities on the ship, and she knew where he had come from and where his kingdom lay. Come, little sister, the other princesses said, with their arms round each other's shoulders, 
they rose in a long row out of the sea, in front of the place where they knew the prince's palace lay. It had been built on a light, yellow, gleaming type of stone, with marble staircases. One came right down to the sea. Magnificent gilt domes rose up above the roof and between the columns that went round the entire building, and there were marble statues that looked as if they were alive. Through the clear glass in the tall windows, one could glimpse the most magnificent halls, and they were hung with precious silk curtains and tapestries, and the walls were adorned with large paintings, which were a sheer joy to look at. In the middle of the largest hall, there was a large plashing fountain, and jets shooting up towards the glass dome in the ceiling, through which the sun shone on the water and the lovely plants growing in the large pond. Now she knew where he lived, and she went there many an evening or night on the water. She swam much closer to the land than any of the others had dared. She even went right up to the narrow canal, under the magnificent marble balcony that cast a long shadow over the water. Here she sat and gazed at the young prince, who thought he was completely alone in the bright moonlight. Many evenings she saw him sail about with his music and his magnificent boat with its fluttering flags. He peeped out through the green rushes. If the wind caught her silvery white veil, if anyone saw it, they just thought it was a swan lifting its wings. So that was the third part of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. It is quite an epic saga and I won't be able to read it all in one video. So you'll have to wait until the next one to hear what happens to her. We're coming to the end of my time lapse now. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you're taking part in Mermaid, please do let me know where I can see all of your wonderful mermaid artwork. Do stay safe and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Bye-bye.